question that makes it a little easier for you to address, Chancellor. Are you satisfied with the current framework for dealing with banks in trouble, given that three authorities over the past week changed the rules? The US bailed out the uninsured depositors of Silicon Valley Bank. The UK relaxed the ring fencing requirements for HSBC in return for agreeing to buy the UK subsidiary of SVB. And the Swiss reversed the priority of creditors in allowing shareholders to receive value while the bondholders were wiped out. I mean, a potential issue about all bail-in bonds. So if the rules of the game can be changed when a crisis is being resolved, does this create uncertainty about how to handle future crises? I think it's a fair question to ask, but I would say that um, in the two European examples that uh, you talked about, uh, they were, in the broader schemes, adjustments that were made in order to make a sale possible. Um, so I wouldn't characterize them as quite such a momentous change as you've said. I think in the circumstances in both cases, a sale was the optimal outcome. Um, it meant that alternative outcomes that would have created a much bigger shock in the international financial system were not necessary. So I think they were the right ones. And um, But I, I do accept that they, they do in themselves represent changes to what was originally envisaged. Well, I, I, I don't want to spend too much time because I know others want to come in on this, but I'll just to clarify with you, you see these, what, as one-off changes? Or uh, how, 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 should, how, how, should, how should basically the structure now be viewed? Oh, when it count, let me talk about the one which I'm more familiar with, which is the, what happened to the um, UK subsidiary of Silicon Bank. In that situation, in order to make the purchase by HSBC possible, uh, there was a small change in the ring fencing requirements, which I don't believe had any systemic implications. I'd like to pick that up a little bit later, if I may. I've got a second. Just, just, just to be clear, sorry, I know you need to tread with care, Chancellor, but um, there's obviously a lot of concern about the reversal in the normal hierarchy of claims. Are you, are you concerned about, the, the, about that perception taking root? Well, I think there is, you know... It's a situation in which there is no obvious solution which doesn't involve some compromises, and I wholly support the decisions made by the Swiss authorities that made the purchase by UBS possible. In the circumstances, I think uh, they took the right decision and we had the best possible outcome. Thank you. Baroness Snooks? Uh, Chancellor, you, you said that uh, you uh, saw the, the financial system as being more resilient uh, than it certainly was in the last financial crisis, and people commonly refer to the higher capital ratios and the higher liquidity ratios that now exist. Um, but what became evident in the instance over the last couple of weeks is that the magnitude of flows uh, can be very, very large and can uh, therefore cause the problem. And those magnitudes are likely to be greater than those that have been embedded in stress tests. Are you really comfortable uh, that the UK financial system uh, is resilient enough uh, in the light of recent events? Well, the Bank of England's view is that the answer to that question is yes. They think that um, you know the stress test that they did, notwithstanding your question, shows that the system is resilient. I think we have to recognise that we're undergoing a period of change um, as we move from a period of extremely low interest rates to a period of higher interest rates and that is causing globally adjustments that have to be made and we have to remain vigilant and I said in my budget speech that the government stands ready to take whatever measures might become necessary to maintain stability because we consider that's one of the most important things that we have to do. Lord Griffiths. So, so I think that the, the, uh, the banking system has had such regulation put around it since 2008 that it clearly is in a very strong position. What about the sort of near bank system 
or the financial system more generally. We saw it with pension funds and LDCs. But basically areas where credit has been extended and so on, those institutions don't have to mark to market. They don't have the same sort of controls that were introduced following 2008. It seems to me that is the place which makes me more nervous. And you feel there are little pockets of it around. And that's the sort of thing that could lead people to say, hey, I have to be extra careful and take money out of even banks. Well, um, I think that point just demonstrates how important it is that we continue to monitor carefully all aspects of the financial system, um, including <coughs> newly emerging areas like crypto, um, and make sure that whatever changes happen, uh, we uh, don't do anything that undermines stability and in any way unlearn the lessons of the financial crisis. Could, could I just add something on that? So the Financial Policy Committee, I think, is due to publish its next financial stability report um, uh, by the end of the month. And one of the things that they did in their last report following the LDI, uh, the events on LDI, was to um, uh, begin conducting a, a stress test for the non-bank sector, um, which was last done in 2018, to look at some of these issues and to assure themselves. Very good. Thank you. A quick question from, I'm going to bring up uh, Baroness Kramer and then um, Lord Blackwell. And then Lord yes, Virgie. I I did want to follow up because uh, uh, we're actually, are we not, entering a period in which the government is pressing forward on a fairly aggressive programme of regulatory rollback. Uh, so, so we're not looking about a continuation of the status quo. And I mean, there's so many areas for that rollback. By the time you look at the Financial Services and Markets Bill, that's uh, Solvency UK, uh, that's uh, the Edinburgh reforms that were announced. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested to know whether or not you're now going to sit back and reconsider uh, some of those changes. And I think other people have a range of questions, but I particularly would like to know if you're going to have any reconsideration of ring fencing, which was so critical. I was on the Parliamentary Commission on Banking Standards to bringing stability after the last crisis, and also to the issue of individual responsibility under the senior managers regime, which I understand is also to be watered down along with ring fencing. But, uh, um, and then we've got all the changes in Solvency UK to be able to hold that uh, um, uh, uh, um, illiquid uh, high-risk assets, etc. cetera. So, uh, and a drop in capital buffers generally across the piece. So I just, could you give us a comment on whether or not you are now considering, reconsidering some of that program of regulatory rollback? Well, um, the first thing I would say is that sticking with the status quo is not necessarily the best thing to do to ensure financial stability. Uh, if we want stability, we should always be prepared to look at policy and make sure that um, it is fit for purpose given changing global, global circumstances. Um, and that also means that we should make sure that we get the right balance between uh, stability and growth potential. Uh, we will publish a consultation mid this year um, on a package of near-term reforms to ring fencing in line with the recommendations from the SKIOC review, but we would not do anything that will undermine financial stability. And I made it very clear when we announced the Edinburgh reforms that we wouldn't unlearn the lessons of the financial crisis. I find it quite hard to unwrap the actual protection and say, oh, but, you know, it's meaningless. Uh, it's, uh, it wasn't providing protection at all. Uh, surely what we've seen over the last few weeks is that protection has been absolutely vital. Well, I think you will see when we publish our recommendations as to which reforms we want to proceed with that we recognise the importance of the protections that have, been, that have been put in place and we don't want to undermine them. Um, very good, thank you. Um, sorry, I'm going to bring in Lord Blackwell. Uh, it's just going to ask Chancellor. I mean, uh, the, the recent issues and the previous issues with pension funds are partly a consequence of the speed with which interest rates have been raised here and elsewhere. And I just wonder, you know, whether in your discussion to the Bank of England there's any reflection on, you know, the appropriateness of that speed. Well, I think um, I have regular discussions with the, the Governor of the Bank of England, and we, we talk about all these things uh, to answer you very directly. Um, but 
you know, we also talk a lot about the fact that we need to bring inflation down. It's over 10% at the moment. That's dangerously high, and uh, we need to do everything we can to maintain our focus on bringing it down. So I only ever say to him, please do what you think is necessary, as indeed you're legally bound to do under the Bank of England Act. Um, but um, yes, we have all these discussions, and I'm sure you're absolutely right to say that the speed of interest rate <coughs> rises is the root cause of um, the volatility that we've seen in recent months. Very good. Lord Virgin. Chancellor, um, we've seen the so solutions to the latest crises uh, is basically a takeover by other banks, which, co which is causing larger and larger banks, particularly with the Credit Suisse situation. Do you think that's a danger now? We're going to get into the territory of moral hazard, of too big to fail. Um, uh, love your comments on that. Well, we have, I think, a very um, robust plan to deal with the globally significant banks that would cause a danger to stability if they were allowed to fail. And there's procedures that have been put in place. We haven't yet had to test those procedures, uh, even though one of those banks has now been bought by another. Um, but if it's any reassurance to you, I think you're asking the right question. And when we were having uh, extensive discussions over a very long weekend with the Prime Minister, the Governor of the Bank of England, uh, the, the head of the PRA, um, as to the right way forward for Silicon Valley Bank UK, um, and we looked at all the options on the table because we didn't know that the uh, sale to HSBC would definitely go through. So we had to be ready with other options as well. Um, we discussed moral hazard extensively because it is very important that we don't lose that principle in the system. Thanks, Chancellor. Um, just one question before I come back to Lord Virginia on the budget. Um, just taking a few steps back, um, you mentioned in one of your earlier answers that inflation is your bringing inflation down is your number one priority. Is that is that still the case in light of events for the last few weeks? Is that still the case for you and the bank? Yes, it is. Um, it's the Prime Minister's uh, first priority to halve inflation. Um, of course, we will do that in a way that uh, maintains as best we're able stability in financial markets, but we should remember that inflation itself is destabilizing. So it is not an answer to say that we're going to suddenly change our minds and say it's acceptable to have a, a rate of inflation that is, you know, as destabilizingly high as over 10%. Thank you. Very good. Right. Let's turn to the budget. Um, Lord Virgie. Thank you. Uh, Chancellor, given the weak and uncertain outlook for growth, what plans do you have to mitigate the tax burden on households and businesses? Well, thank you. It's a very important question. Um, I do believe that a dynamic, successful economy needs to be lightly taxed. And you know, my conservative principles also say that we should bring down the burden of personal taxation as much as we can, uh, because that is consistent with uh, a free society. So that's my intellectual starting point. From the point of view of growing the economy um, and getting out of the, uh, the low growth, low productivity paradox that we've been wrestling with in the UK, um, I think that it's very important that we have competitive levels of business taxation. And so that was why in the budget, from a business point of view, um, one of the most important measures was full expensing of corporation tax. It amounts to a, a nine billion pounds cut in corporation tax. So even though the headline rate is going up, it's still a lower headline rate than any other G7 country. And by introducing full expensing, we have um, the most competitive tax regime of any OECD country, top equal, when it comes to investment incentives. And that's why the CBI said in their reaction to the budget that that decision keeps us at the top table when it comes to the attractiveness of investment from an international standpoint. So can I just ask, Chancellor, just in terms of where you're looking out, given today's borrowing figures are slightly better than expected, given there's 
talk of you getting some headroom. Do you think that there is the prospect of you being able to look to lower taxes on uh, families who are very hard pressed at the moment sometime between now and the next election? How are the chances of this going? Can I tempt you into saying something to us on this? Well, um, Chair, I've only been Chancellor for a few months and what I have learned over that period is that as night follows day there will always be articles saying the Chancellor has unexpectedly more headroom than anticipated. Um, and I've always learned to take those stories in the press with a large pinch of salt because it's never yet happened to me. Um, but I would say that, um, of course, it's a priority for any Conservative Chancellor to bring down the burden of tax on families. But there are things that are even more important than that. One of them is stability, um, because as we've just been talking about, there is a lot of volatility in the world at the moment. Um, and the second is the competitiveness of the UK economy, from which comes the growth that means that we can afford to bring down tax. Uh, so I don't think we're in a position to make any assessment as to how soon it will be that we can bring down the tax burden on families, but it would always be a priority for me. Lord Blackwell? Uh, Chelsea, a lot of your measures are rightly aimed at longer term growth in the economy by improving productivity and supply side. Uh, but in the short term, the, the Bank of England's clear view is that any higher growth rate would be inconsistent with uh, maintaining <coughs> the inflation targets. Um, so. Do you agree with that? And doesn't that mean that actually, you know, you can't use any headroom to reduce taxes because they would simply try and offset that? I agree with it to a point. I think it's very important that monetary and fiscal policy point in the same direction rather than tug against each other. But I think there are short-term things that you can do uh, that increase growth um, in a non-inflationary way. And the main area, and this in fact is one of the main reasons I focused on this area, is on labour supply. Um, if, you know, if you can reduce the difficulty that businesses have in filling their 1.1 million vacancies, uh, then it's possible to grow sustainably in a non-inflationary way. And a lot of the measures that I introduced in the budget uh, will take effect quite quickly, and I hope that will be their impact. Thank you. Well, Griffiths. Councillor, you uh, set out in the budget very clearly uh, targets for both inflation and for fiscal rooms. And the inflation target is clearly something we're already well, strongly predicted by almost all forecasters to come down. And I think people feel that can easily be met. Uh, the fiscal target, target is a little more challenging debt to GDP, it's gone up this year over last year and next year it's going up again. And then after five years, it, it's coming down. The margin is fairly small. Uh, and I just wonder if you ever wake at night and have uh, some anxiety, <laughs> what your anxieties would be as to what could in a way um, you know, knock this off course? Well, um, I'm not sure that's a question I've been asked in that way before. But um, the, the first thing I would say, if I may, is that I think it's really important that we don't take for granted, uh, even though all the forecasters say we're going to hit the Prime Minister's inflation target, we, we don't take that for granted. And the reason I don't think we can take it for granted is because uh, about just under 5% of fall inflation will fall out automatically because of uh, changes in uh, fuel and food prices. But um, there's still nearly 6.5% of what economists call core inflation, mm. which is driven, amongst other things, by pay pressures, which remain relatively strong. So I, you know, I don't think we can take for granted that we're going to bring down those inflationary pressures, and I think we need to keep our foot on the accelerator. Mm. Um, you're absolutely right that you know, debt is uh, broadly 100% of GDP. Uh, debt interest payments, £115 billion a year. That is very, very high. That's money we can't spend on public services. Um, and it's less within our control because of 
you know, international movements in interest rates. But it is something we need to continue to focus on. <coughs> it's very, very important in terms of uh, being able to send a signal that the UK will always be good for our debt. Well, Griffiths, do you want to come in? Any more on that point? No. I think that Can I just ask Chancellor, to what extent do you think the government should be focusing on um, getting the debt ratio down by a specific year rather than moving the five-year goalpost further each year in advance? Um, I think I understand why one might ask that question. Um, but I think doing it in that way replaces one challenge with a different one, and it's not necessarily the right way to do it. What I would say, I'm not sure there's necessarily a fiscal target or a fiscal rule that could encapsulate this, but I think the right answer to that question is, are chancellors in every budget doing things that improve the long-term growth potential and productivity potential of the British economy that will put us in a position where we are able to bring down debt sustainably. I think that's the way that you avoid getting trapped in a vice of uh, lower growth and lower ability to repay debt. Paul Johnson, sorry, I, I'm just going to ask for one final question before I bring in Lord Rooker. Paul Johnson was quite, um, well, he was quite critical. He said that you were meeting the fiscal rules, and I quote, by a combination of tight spending, Paul Johnson from the IFS, tight spending plans, imaginary future increases in federal duties, and a fiscal gain from unwillingly undoing your corporation tax change. What do you say to that? Um, I think that, you know, Paul Johnson comments extensively on uh, the budget. I was actually very pleased that he said that he could identify a growth plan inside the budget. He could identify a, a plan to tackle our long-term uh, productivity challenges. Um, and although there were lots of uh, interesting cartoons uh, concerning my recitation of the four E's, our approach to tackling those issues, I think they do form the bones of a plan that most economists, including Paul Johnson, would recognise are the long-term way that we will increase our growth potential. What about how you met the fiscal rule, though, and, your, and the point he's making about imaginary <coughs> increases in fuel duty and a fiscal gain from unwillingly doing your corporation tax? Isn't that how you how you made the figures well, I think add up in his mind. Well, Johnson would also say, but it's not for me to put words into his mouth, that um, some of these fiscal rules are themselves necessarily a little bit arbitrary. But in the circumstances, I think the question that I would like him and other commentators to answer positively is, are we tackling the long-term uh, challenges to our productivity that will make us prosperous in the long run? Because that's the key answer. Lord Rooker. Uh, Chancellor, good afternoon. Um, I want to ask you about spending plans, but before I do, can I give you the chance to explain how the NHS pay deal is going to be funded? Because we really need to know if any of the new increase that was agreed is coming from existing NHS budgets, or is it going to be new money? Employees are voting and there's no clarity from the Department of Health about the funding of this deal that was agreed. Are you able to give us a, any explanation for that? I'll make a brief comment and then I'll hand over to my colleague, Cat Little. But, um, you know, the, the answer is that we, have, we are spending record amounts uh, this year and next. Public spending is continuing to increase in cash terms. Uh, we've made a commitment that uh, there won't be a reduction in frontline public services in order to fund these deals. Uh, we will have discussions with departments about the best way to fund it. But our approach in these negotiations was not one that was primarily driven by affordability, although that was an important factor. It was primarily driven by not being prepared to do a pay settlement that would itself be inflationary. And that was why it was so difficult, because it took us time to get to that point. But Kat, you might want to add to that. Of course. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, firstly, it might be useful to explain a bit about how we deal with spending pressures generally. I mean, I'm sad to say that it's not just pay pressures. There are significant inflationary pressures across the whole of public spending that we're grappling with. And you may recall last year we launched the Efficiency and Savings Review specifically 
to make sure that we were working with departments to find efficiencies, to create contingency, and to make sure that they had the, the reserves available to deal with some of the headwinds of inflation and pay um, that we were expecting. So we, we work every single day with all departments and with the Department of Health probably more than others to find efficiencies, to prioritise spend and to make sure that between us we can fund the pressures that they experience. Just in terms of the numbers, um, next year's pay settlement is likely to cost about £1.3 billion above the um, budgeted amount that the department's got available. £1.3 billion in a budget of £160 billion. Um, Obviously, these are large numbers, but that is a fairly normal amount of money for us to be reprioritising without impacting on frontline services. The other thing I'd say is you compare it to what we did last year, the headline um, pay settlement for Agenda for Change last year was 4.75% compared to a 3% budget. And we, through our normal processes, found the money and made sure that the department was able to fund those pay settlements and live within its budgets. Mm. So it's very much, much a partnership, and we're starting that process now to make sure that we can sustainably fund the pressures that the Department of Health has got. Thanks very much. I mean, I, I fully accept the difficulties, but the need for clarity is pretty urgent in some ways because people are still voting and it, it's not all being settled. And the more clarity, the easier it is to get a settlement. On the spending plans, can I just ask you about, um, Chancellor, in your statement of November last year, which I fully accept was delivered in very exceptional circumstances, you said for the remaining two years of the spending review, and I quote, we will protect the increase in departments' budgets we've already set out in cash terms, unquote. So this is a cash freeze um, for two years, which is a real terms cut in public expenditure. That's what it amounts to. Um, so the question is, do you still stand by this? And if so, how will the health and social care and the school's budgets actually be dealt with in those two years? And we've got 24,000 schools. You've got 7 million people on the waiting list. We need to know this if we're going to have cuts in public expenditure now, is that going to happen or not if for those particular departments? No, because um, what we said in the autumn statement was that uh, unprotected departments would have to make efficiency savings to deal with their inflation pressures. They all had very generous increases in their budget, um, increases that were greater than inflation was predicted to be at the time. Uh, in their uh, spending review settlement. We said we would honour those settlements in cash terms. Obviously, what happened in the meantime was inflation ended up being much higher than planned. So they would have to use some of the increases in their budget to deal with inflationary pressures uh, by finding as many efficiencies as possible. But we made an exception for schools and for the NHS and care. In both of them, we, uh, for the NHS and care system, we increase their annual budget by £8 billion a year. And for schools, we increase their budget by £2.3 billion a year. So they both got uh, very generous settlements in the circumstances um, in order to make sure that they really were able to protect frontline services. And just that, you know, my final point, the, the, you announced increases in childcare as well. So I, I presume that that's still secure. Yes, it doesn't affect um, those, those it settlements. It doesn't affect. OK, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lord Turnbull, do you want to go in? Um, <clears throat> Chancellor, do you ever, in your private moments, ever wonder about whether you're setting yourself an objective, a low-tax economy that is condemning you to failure? You've got um, uh, an ageing population, a dependency ratio that's getting worse. You've got a strong appetite for goods which, and services which are provided collectively as opposed to goods and services which are provided from privately financed post-tax income and a population that is getting older and more interested in protecting the wealth that they've got rather than getting more wealth. So you're, are you really pushing against a tide that you're just not going to be able to resist? Um. It's the kind of question that a wise former cabinet secretary uh, could ask, and I think it's, it's a perfectly reasonable question to ask. Um, I fully accept that with an ageing population, uh, as a civilised society, we would want to support people in their old age and 
given that we have a well-established taxpayer-funded system for health and to an extent care, which I support, taxes will be higher than might otherwise have been envisaged. Uh, but I don't think we need to say that means we will inevitably become a high-tax society if we are smart in how we approach economic growth. And what that means is we need to take a strategic approach to economic growth that isn't just looking about how you grow the economy over the next two years, but actually thinks about how you're going to grow the economy over the next 20 years. And I would say that if you said to me, how are we going to fund the NHS and stop taxes getting unbearably high uh, or uncompetitively high, um, our big opportunity uh, over the next 20 years is to become Europe's Silicon Valley, to be uh, the cradle of life sciences, technology, clean energy, creative industries, advanced manufacturing. And I think the strength of our university sector and our financial services combined with our um, you know, already proven business success in those areas gives us that opportunity. I don't say we've achieved it. It's not going to be achieved before the next election. This is a, a long-term vision for the country. But if I look at uh, what Nigel Lawson did with Big Bang in 1986, uh, you have a set of reforms that meant that long after Lord Lawson had departed from being Chancellor of the Exchequer, he put in place plans that made the City of London one of the world's two great financial centres, and that's what we need to be thinking about. And that, I think, would be my answer in, in the longer term as to how we get ourselves out of that paradox. Can I, can I jump into you know, Just in terms of just politics being the language of priorities, is your priority, coming back to what we were discussing earlier, to relieve the tax burden on families and small businesses in particular, or would it be to protect the services which Lord Rooker was referring to in terms of spending? Well, I, um, I would like to do both. And I think, you know, it's possible to do both. Um, I think the priority at the moment is to put in place uh, a plan for growth, which means that we have competitive levels of business taxation. So we made a choice in the budget last week to reduce corporation tax by £9 billion a year in order to make the UK an attractive place to invest in. Um, I, I ought to just add to um, my answer to Lord Turnbull that I'm not hanging my hat entirely on being Europe's Silicon Valley. I think that's part of the answer. But part of the answer is other long-term changes, such as transforming our skills, dealing with economic inactivity, um, making sure that we spread growth more evenly across the country, uh, things that have also bedeviled our productivity over very many years. But the reason I talk about all those things together is because you talked about a longer-term challenge of an ageing population, gradually increasing pressure on public resources. These are longer-term solutions, but they're in the... Um, important but not urgent category and it's very important that we set about doing them with vigour. I'm going to read Lord Blackwell briefly and then Lord Davies. Councillor, I mean, the, part of the role of uh, your wonderful Treasury officials is to prevent profligate chancellors spending too much or cutting taxes too much and, you know, to produce forecasts that um, discourage that. But is there a danger that that underestimates the potential benefit of reduced taxation. Um, if you want entrepreneurial growth of the sort you described, it seems to me that's much more likely to come about um, with low taxes and indeed buoyant demand. And uh, you know, we may not all believe in the Lafayette curve, but you know, the potential for that to then end up with more growth and more taxes rather than simply adding a deficit to a static model. You know, I, w I wonder whether that is underestimated in the way the Treasury thinks about taxation. Um, my experience is that um, it, it's not underestimated by the Treasury at all. Um, I would say that if you look at the choices I made in the budget, um, I said that having the most competitive capital investment regime in the OECD is a priority even though it doesn't necessarily show through 
very strongly in the five-year growth forecast that we published, um, it's an important thing to do. And I want to get there over time. I can afford to do it for three years. I couldn't afford to do it permanently. So I'm prepared to do that because I think it's an important thing to do. Um, and I think it's very important uh, that I, as Chancellor, am prepared to embrace policies that may not show through in the near to medium term, but are very important for the long term. And so I, that for me actually is the definition of success of a budget. It's a budget that people look back on in five or ten years' time and say, actually, you were trying to answer the right questions and you took the right decisions, even if it didn't necessarily mean there was a, a two-year impact. Well, Davis. Yes, I'm going to ask about pension tax allowances, but first I was struck, Chancellor, by referring to Lawson's reforms that turned the city into a powerhouse. We seem to be going in the opposite direction at the moment with your own city minister expressing concern about the way things are developing and the loss of um, uh, investments from the stock exchange and so on. Are you going to come up with a comprehensive plan to address that? You know, at the moment you're undertaking a whole series of different measures, but do you want to adopt a comprehensive plan to follow in the footsteps of uh, the noble Lord, Lord Lawson? Well, they are very hallowed footsteps, um, <laughs> and so I wouldn't overflatter myself, but I would say that the, the package of Edinburgh reforms that we announced were partly intended to do that. Um, what I announced in the budget last week was that there are some very specific issues um, relating to the availability of scale-up capital for our entrepreneurial companies, uh, which is partly linked to why some of them are choosing to list overseas, because uh, there isn't so much capital or choice available here as we would like. There are some pension industry reforms that are very important. So, and I promised I would come back by the autumn statement, although I'm sure we'll say a lot more before the autumn statement, in terms of the reforms that I intend to bring forward in that area. But I don't think my perspective, or the city minister's perspective, is quite as downbeat as, as you suggested, if I may say. I think my overall perspective on the city is that um, at the time of the Brexit vote, there was a view that it would suffer much worse than it actually has. And I think the city has shown itself to be extremely resilient. And I think the fact that we are prepared to adapt and change and rethink through uh, the regulatory changes that are necessary to keep the city competitive is a sign of just how strong it is. Yes, I think, I think other members will be coming back on that issue, actually. Um, on your, one of your, your ease was employment, and you had measures to address labour supply shortages. And the most contentious one of those was the changes to pension tax allowances. And um, some of them, uh, in, in introducing them, both in the budget and uh, speech and in the your interview on the Today programme, if I mention that, placed considerable emphasis on medical practitioners, even though the measures affect everybody. Now, certain changes, um, the, the new flexibilities in the NHS scheme, the change to the annual allowance, the aggregation of pension input amounts, that's all passed through without much comment and much support. An issue has appeared about the lifetime allowance. And my question is that what impact do you think that the lifetime allowance abolition, as compared to these other measures, will have on employment? What evidence do you have that this will achieve, uh, that this will address labour supply shortages? And if there is evidence, are you prepared to share that evidence so we can judge it for ourselves? Because a considerable <coughs> amount of money, the additional expenditure in this budget is under this head, and I'm not sure that we've actually seen any real evidence that it will, that in itself will achieve the objectives that you've set. Well, um, the first thing I would say is that um, the cost of this particular measure is 
massively dwarfed by, for example, the cost of the childcare measures, which are estimated to be, uh, I think, more than seven times higher. But um, it is very important for the NHS. And the BMA, who haven't always been my biggest fans historically, <laughs> Uh, said that uh, doctors would no longer be forced to retire early. They said that doctors were already contacting the BMA the morning after the budget, saying they wanted to come back out of retirement. But also... Uh, I to interrupt, but that's in response to the package of a, as a whole, I'm asking you specifically about the lifetime allowance. Well, the lifetime allowance was the biggest single element of that package. Yeah, I, I knew um, that. And so um, it's, it's a combination of the lifetime allowance and the change in the annual allowance. But, um, but it isn't just, to answer your question, it isn't just doctors. Um, we have the um, chair of the Association of Police and Crime Commissioners who said it was a game changer for keeping police fighting crime on the streets. The Association of School and College Leaders said it was in the national interest in terms of head teachers. And um, if you look at the OECD rankings for participation rates for over 50s in the workforce, we are down at 22nd out of 38 OECD countries, and we've been falling. If we had the same participation rate, so that means that we've got more people retiring early than in other OECD countries. If we had the same participation rates as Sweden, for example, we would have a million more over 50s in the workplace, which is about one for every vacancy there is in the economy at the moment. Um, and this is not the only reason that people are retiring early, but in terms of the, the levers at my control, under my control as Chancellor, it is one of the only things I could do. And I wanted to present the most comprehensive possible package of reforms across parents, long-term sick and disabled, job seekers, and over 50s. Mm -hmm. Why? Because one of the fundamental debates we've been having, although the, the economy has been growing uh, respectably compared to other countries since the financial crisis, about the same growth as Germany since 2010, um, living standards on an individual basis has not been growing as high as fast as we would like and the way you grow GDP per head one of the ways is by reducing inactivity there's seven million adults of working age who are not engaged in the workforce and we want to remove the barriers that stop them being engaged I understand all that my question is more specific for what you said the evidence you have is that some people have said that they will be staying or returning to work given your package of measures. My question is, to what extent does the lifetime allowance abolition uh, play in that overall effect? And as a supplementary, you, I think there's a figure of 15,000 people who uh, increase in the workforce, presumably made up of people who don't leave and people who return. This is a comprehensive figure, 15,000. It would be interesting to know uh, what the source of that figure is and uh, how many of those are medical practitioners. So, uh, I, I, I still haven't really had an answer to the question of how significant the lifetime allowance is. Okay. Getting people back. I, to be entirely open, I don't think it's very important. Okay. Um, obviously, I made a deal. package, even though it's expensive, uh, you've sort of admitted that you don't know specifically what proportion is due to the change in the lifetime allowance. But also, as a subsidiary question, to what extent is this actually going to get doctors? Because you've placed the emphasis on medical practitioners in terms of this policy change. To how many extra doctors are they going to be in the workforce because of the changes of a, as a whole and of that number how many are there because of the lifetime allowance I will try to answer the question as comprehensively as I can I obviously do believe the lifetime allowance will have a significant impact because that's why I included it in the budget um, when it comes to doctors uh, I can only tell you what the doctors themselves are saying 
they think it will have a significant impact. This has never happened before. We've never had a situation where you, you have a lifetime allowance and then it's abolished. So it's not possible by definition to point to proof as to what the impact will be. We'll have to wait and see in a year's time, two years time. The Office for Budget Responsibility predicted that overall uh, their package would lead, the, the package of labour supply measures, including for the over 50s, would lead to 110,000 more people. Um, but that was their central case. They said it could be up to 240,000. Um, I am very hopeful that it will be considerably more than the 110,000 they predicted, but none of us know because this is a new measure and we've never had a budget that's primarily focused on increasing labour supply. But I would just point out that there are 3.3 million over 50s who've retired early. Um, about 150,000 people choose to retire early every year. I'm not particularly planning uh, on these measures bringing people back who've already decided to retire, although there's some evidence anecdotally that doctors are willing to come back as a mm. result of this change. It's more about stemming the flow, reducing that 150,000 down uh, over the next few years. Uh, and I am very hopeful that's what will happen. Yeah. Very quickly, quickly just because to, we've got others wanting to come in, sorry. Just to follow up. You, you said when you were chair of the Health Committee, I know that was then and this is now, but you suggested at that stage a is an arrangement much more targeted specifically doctors and I just wondered to what extent consideration had been given to that uh, and, and why it had been rejected because there's the example of the special scheme for judges uh, because they were seen as a priority well given the crisis in the NHS I think it would be possible to easily make a case that doctors are priority and they deserve a special scheme. It, was that given detailed consideration? Yes, um, and when we looked at it, there, by the time you've done a scheme for doctors, and by the way a scheme for senior police officers and head teachers and other very important public services, uh, it could end up being nearly as expensive as what we did on the lifetime allowance, and also more aggressive because um, what we announced in the budget doesn't help the 20% wealthiest of doctors. It helps about 80% of doctors. Um, if we'd done a doctors only scheme, it would have helped the very wealthiest of doctors. Um, and so on balance, because, and this was something I was not aware of when I was chair of the Health and Social Care Select Committee, we do also have an issue of increasing numbers of people choosing to retire early. And I want to change that culture. Uh, I think we need to move away from a society where retirement is seen as a cliff edge decision that's going to uh, come up at you uh, at some stage after you've turned 50 to something that I think is much more in tune with what most people would want, which is um, a gradual change, uh, maybe more flexible working, maybe more working from home. but a society in which we're able to tap into the talents of some of our most experienced, able and capable people for a very long time. And so that, that's why I think the change in the lifetime allowance is important because hitting your pension pot cap is one of the things that creates a mentality of a cliff edge. And that's a mentality that I hope to change. Uh, so, it's to, a, uh, just a follow up, final. Sorry, so it must be final, yeah. Yes, yes, so final, final. Briefly. So, it's as much the psychological effect of the pension cap as the financial. Well, it, it's a psychological effect that I hope will have a real world impact in terms of making it easier for people to continue to participate in the workforce, especially if they're doctors. Excellent. Thank you very much. Lord Turnbull wants to come in briefly and then Lord Rooker. I'm delighted you're resisting the um, pressure you'll come under for a bespoke deal for doctors. Um, you, it's ridiculous <coughs> that scheme for the consultant at University College Hospital, not for the professor at University College. Anyway, so stick to your guns on that, please. Can I come back to the basic logic of taxation of savings? In his book, Paul Johnson's book, which I recommend 
all staff and ministers in the department should read. Uh, it says, Eniman economists have been arguing for years that the principle of saving being free of tax and then paying tax at the end when money is taken out of the savings is a good one. Now, there were two areas in which that principle was being violated. One was the pensions allowance, in other words, people, lifetime allowance, where people were taking money when they took it out of the fund, they didn't get the tax relief when it went in. And the second is that um, the taxation of lump sum. In other words, people could be taking money out tax-free when they got tax relief going in. So I just wonder whether it would have been a more logical, symmetrical, also help with the arithmetic, to have looked at what a lot of economists think is the excessively generous treatment of the lump sum. Um, it, we looked at all options. Our priority in this budget was removing the barriers to participation in the workforce. But if you're saying to me, um, should we keep under review reforms to broader savings policy, then I would agree with that. I think there's lots of things that you could look at. And the reason I, I think that's important is because if we want to become better at investing for the future as a society, increased rates of business investment, increased rates of personal investment, we need to become better at saving as well. And we need to look at all those things to make sure that the right incentives are in place. And I fully accept there's more to be done in that area. Could I just add, Chair, sorry to interrupt. We did, we did take a step to freeze, at the current level, the pension comm commencement lump sum. So the life, it will be a quarter of the lifetime allowance that exists this year, even once the lifetime allowance is abolished. So, so the, the kind of tax-free lump sum will be capped at its current value and won't become a quarter of whatever you have saved when there is no lifetime allowance. Hey, Lord Rooker, did you want to come in? Uh I'm absolutely with you on stemming the flow. Uh, it's a lot easier uh, to do that than try and get people back. We did a short report before Christmas about the missing workers. And I mean, our greatest asset is the capacity and willingness of people to work. Um, and one way to stem the flow, which we didn't look at when we did our short inquiry, is to change the age. Why on earth have we stuck it at 55? Why hasn't that gone up, say, to 57 before you can get access to the pension? I mean, we might, we almost <coughs> joke and laugh about what's happening in France at the moment. We think, well, how can they have these 62? And yet we've got millions of people. I mean, access to their pensions are 55. Now, one way to stem the flow is to change that date. I, I agree, to, it could be a cliff edge, it would have to be done carefully, but it would be one way to stem the flow. Um, in a way that I think is wholly productive and, and sensible. Um, uh, I'm pleased to report that the uh, normal minimum pension age is rising to 57 in 2028. So that is, that is in the system and will be taking, taking place. It was announced, I think, in 2014 to give people more than a decade's notice. But from 2028, you won't be able to access your pension uh, until you're 57. Ah, I didn't know that. That's very good information. I'm 56, so it's, uh, right. I'm just going to get in under the wire. <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> hello. Can, Lord Rooker, anything else you want to make? No, oh, no, that's fine. And can, can we just move on to something else that our report touched on, which is changes in immigration? And I was very interested, as were others, um, on the OBR's estimate um, that net migration is now likely to settle at 245,000 a year. Um, is it not the case, given that you, what you're saying about you're trying to um, uh, stem the flow, um, is it not the case then when you look at this big picture that really growth in the labour supply is actually being powered by immigration? At the moment, that is what the ONS are saying and the OBR basically take their numbers from the Office for National Statistics. And if you want to change our economic model, which I think is what the country decided when we voted collectively for Brexit, uh, to a model that is not dependent on unlimited migration, which we had access to as part of the single market, then you've got to have another plan. And our plan 
is really what I announced in the budget, which is to say, well, let's look at the 7 million adults who are not in the workforce. Um, you know, when we have 1.1 million vacancies, as I mentioned, in the economy, this is a solvable problem. Um, but we've got to systematically remove the barriers. Um, we've talked about older people. Uh, we talked a bit about parents, but, you know, two and a half million long-term sick and disabled. Uh, surely, in a world where there's Zoom and Teams and working from home, we should not write someone off as incapable of work because they have mobili mobility issues, perhaps they're wheelchair bound, uh, in a way that might have happened five or 10 years ago because there are just so many jobs that people can do from home with a computer. So I think there's a huge revolution there in what's possible for people who've got an enormous contribution to make. As things stand, sorry, coming back to the figures, it does suggest that the growth in labour supply is being driven by immigration, correct? I mean... Well, that's before we've seen any of the impact of what I announced in the budget. I'm hoping that we will see in uh, future forecasts of migration that we'll see an economy that is less dependent on migration. And are you concerned, though, that what we found in our report, the growing mismatch that the migration system is geared towards uh, high-skilled uh, migrants, whereas actually we have a low or lesser-skilled um, vacancies within the workforce, does that mismatch concern you? Well, we have structures in place that are intended to deal with that. Uh, you know, the Migration Advisory Committee looks at where shortages are um, irrespective of skill level, um, and if, the, if it doesn't judge that the economy can fill those shortages, for example, in the care sector, then they, they put sectors onto the shortage occupation list. But I think the, the broader answer to your question is we need to transform our skills. I think our education system does a brilliant job for the 50% of school leavers who go, who go to university, but I think we can do better with the 50% who don't go to university. There have been some really big improvements. I think the apprenticeship programme um, has been transformative for many people, but we can still do better. And, but these things take time, and I think you know, there is going to be an element of migration as we start to make these changes. It's quite a big element of migration. I, I take your point entirely, it takes time to do those things, but in the shorter term, are you therefore keeping the door ajar to um, relaxing uh, lower immigration for lower, lesser skilled um, roles? Well, um, we have outside the EU a controlled migration system. So when we make those relaxations, if we make them, it's on the basis of a decision by an independent committee who say there's a shortage in this sector or that sector. I think that's the right system to have. But do I want, over the medium term, to have an economy that is dependent on uh, ever-increasing levels of migration, whether skilled or unskilled? No, I, I want to move to a high-wage, high-skill economy. Sorry to press you. Just one final question, though. Therefore, do you think that this 245,000 figure, it sounds to me that you're feeling that that figure is too high for your liking in the forecast? Well, um, you know, it's a statement of what the ONS consider to be reality. It's my job as Chancellor to put in place policies that make it possible to see a world in which we're able to reduce that over time. Is that a yes or a...? <laughs> um, I, think it's, I think it's a straight answer to the question, though. I mean, I'm putting in place a, a plan that means okay. that we can reduce okay. that, but I'm recognising it takes time for that plan to take effect. Um, moving on, then. Business investment. Lord Lonsborough. Uh, good afternoon, Chancellor. Yes, so I'd like to focus on business investment and productivity in particular. Uh, I perhaps should declare my own interest as a chairman, advisor, and active investor in a range of SMEs. And I was interested in your earlier comment about having a competitive level um, of business taxation, particularly by international standards. I'd like to focus on corporation tax. Um, as we all know, it's set to increase from 19% to 25% uh, next month. So that's a sudden, eye-watering, 32% leap in that tax rate. Um, it's forecast to raise an annual £18 billion in tax. As you pointed out earlier, softened to some degree over the next three years by the 100% capital allowances. Though I think it's worth pointing out there's a large swathe of businesses that will benefit marginally from the capital allowances. 
um, and many that will not now qualify for R&D tax credits, which we'll come on to later. Um, the sec in the second paragraph of your the Chancellor's strategy for sustained economic growth, uh, I quote, you, you acknowledge that weaker growth in business investment has been one of the reasons for slower productivity growth uh, since 2008. And now, given our workforce capacity constraints, um, that's even more uh, of a relevance. So my question is this, what impact do you think this height in corporation tax will have on one of your four E's, that, that of enterprise, specifically business investment, and how will this impact productivity and growth? Well, um, I think it's important to say that we, uh, even though the headline rate of corporation tax has gone up, it is still lower than anywhere in the G7. America is about to put their corporation tax up to 28%, uh, for example. Um, but we have combined that change with a new capital allowances regime for three years, but a change I hope will be permanent, which means that across 38 OECD countries, there is not one that has a more competitive regime for capital investment. And why does that matter? Because since 2010, uh, although we've grown faster than France and about the same rate as Germany, both those two countries have higher productivity than us. That means they have more capital invested per worker, per working hour. And we have to address that. So we need to be investing more capital per person employed, per hour employed, than we have currently been doing. And the approach that we had previously, which was focusing on bringing down the headline rate of corporation tax, which I myself subscribed to when I was on the back benches, I realized since becoming chancellor, is not wholly the right approach. It is the right thing to say we want to have the most competitive levels of business taxation anywhere. That's important. But within the mix, you need to make sure that you have sufficient incentives for investing in capital. And that's why I think full expensing, uh, which no other large European country offers, is the right way forward. I think that is helpful, but in overall terms, with 25% corporate tax, if we're looking at what I think is the most important um, statistic for business environment, that's the effective overall taxation on business, which obviously includes such taxes as um, employers' national insurance and business rates, as well as corporation tax and others. We, um, and I'm quoting the Centre for Policy Studies here, uh, will now have um, one of the highest rates um, in the developed world and the highest rate that has ever been overall taxation on business in the history of the UK. Um, and that does not seem to square with a, with a plan for growth, particularly, I think, addressing this productivity issue, which I think is a recurring theme, both in OBR and in the spring budget statement, that low levels of business investment have been partly responsible, not wholly responsible, for low productivity. And it's very difficult to see how we break out of this uh, productivity um, uh, constraint with such low levels of investment, which you can see from the OBR are forecast to continue to remain very low. Well, they've, the OBR actually forecast an increase in business investment of 3% a year as a result of the um, decision to introduce full expensing. I don't know whether the CPS figures you quote are post-budget and the nine billion cut in corporation tax or pre that, but all I would say is that if they're post the budget, I don't recognize those because I, I do agree that because diff different countries have different ways of taxing, if you want to look at the overall burden of business taxation, uh, the best way of doing it is to try and look at business tax as a proportion of GDP. And we have lower business tax. If you look at the other G7 countries, we have lower business tax as a proportion of GDP than France, Germany, Italy, or Japan. And although America has a lower business tax rate than us, they're about to increase their corporation tax, as I just mentioned, and they're phasing out full expensing. So they're going in the opposite direction to us. 
So I agree with your general point that we need to have the most competitive levels of business taxation. And I would argue that in the budget we took a very decisive step towards that. To keep, sorry, Chancellor, just, just to, 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 to deliver on your objective, though, you are, we are going to need to see the full expensing continuing beyond the period that you've just set. Otherwise, we're going backwards. I mean, statement of the blinding obvious, correct? That's what I said I would like to do. Um, as, soon as, as soon as it's affordable, I uh, wasn't able to afford to get there in one go. But if you look at other big changes that we've had since uh, the Conservatives have been in power, for example, the increase in tax and NI thresholds that mean that for the first time you can earn £1,000 a month without paying any tax or national insurance. That wasn't something that happened in one budget. That happened because of decisions by successive chancellors. Um, in fact, we only got there last year. So um, this, I think, will be one of those decisions where we we set an aspiration and we get there gradually. Thank you very much. Oh, just, sorry, yes. a, just a final point. Lots of, uh, yes, sorry. We'll go on to it. This is from a business perspective that um, I think I'm right in saying that corporation tax, um, well, it's been chopped and changed and has changed 10 times in the last 13 years. And as you know, and I know your, your background is entrepreneurial, but um, most business plans have a minimum uh, time span of five years um, more in the case of infrastructure and energy. And this constant tweaking, chopping and changing of corporation tax and capital allowances, which I appreciate predates you becoming Chancellor, um, but I certainly think it does not lead to stability, it's uncertainty, and it diminishes business owners and entrepreneurs' appetite for long-term investment plans. If I may say, I, I think that is actually an unfair characterisation of what happened. Uh, what you had was George Osborne as Chancellor saying that he wanted to reduce our corporation tax progressively, the headline rate, and he delivered on that in budget after budget. And I don't think anyone thought that was destabilising. They could see that he had a direction of travel, and in each budget he went further towards that. That's quite a large proportion of those corporation tax changes. And then what you had under um, when, when the current Prime Minister was Chancellor was one change in strategy, I fully accept one change in strategy to address our productivity paradox, which recognised that actually capital allowances are a very important part. It's your effective corporation tax net of capital allowances that really matters. And that is the change that I have continued to implement because I think it's the right approach. Um, and I think the proof of the pudding, if you like, is the reaction of people like the CBI and the Institute of Directors who said that the changes I introduced in the budget. They didn't say, this is yet another change, this is very confusing. They said, actually, this is, I think the IOD used the phrase, hugely encouraging. Um, and the CBI were also very welcoming because they, they understand and agree with the direction of travel. Well, David, is it a quick question? Um, I, I have to apologise to the committee. I should have said when addressing the lifetime allowance that I have a financial interest in the treatment of the, of the lifetime allowance. So Duly noted. Said that. Duly noted. Thank you very much. Baroness Little. Uh, thank you. Um, <laughs> Chancellor, you, you talk about getting uh, the European Silicon Valley up and running, and you've mentioned the most competitive investment uh, regime. Alongside that, the measures announced in the spring budget support technology business investment for three years. Now, three years, particularly with cutting edge technology, is quite a short period of time. Uh, why did you choose three years? Because you could find yourself in a situation where you have these high growth, potentially high growth businesses coming into the market and predatory investors around from the Middle East, the Far East, the United States. So how, how can you create an environment where it's just based on that three years and then anything can happen after that? Well, um, I think the measure you're talking about is the full expensing of capital, um, which is, uh, you know, the, the £9 billion cut in corporation tax. And I have tried to set expectations by saying I hope it's a change that becomes permanent and as soon as it's affordable to do so, that's what I wish to do. But the other big measure that's perhaps more directly related to the, the technology and life science sector 
is the, um, the new R&D tax credit, uh, which has been introduced for research-intensive businesses. That is actually a permanent change. That's not a, a temporary change. Um, and that's a more generous incentive than the one that currently exists. Um, and so I, I hope for that will affect about 20,000 uh, of our most high growth, uh, most innovative companies in the life science sector predominantly um, who spend a lot of money on research and development. It's a permanent change and I hope it will give them a lot of encouragement. I think the idea of a permanent change is actually very important because lots of these companies, particularly you talk about the life sciences, particularly in the science around, for example, net zero, very, very high cost and long lead time. And it's, you, you need to give people reassurance, basically. <coughs> so I, I hope that the reassurance is there. Yes, I should say, by the way, when it comes to green industries, the clean energy sector, there are also a, a large number of uh, subsidies, support mechanisms, uh, things like carbon pricing, contracts for difference, which also give that long-term assurance of income that they will receive on the basis of investments they make. So, I, But I accept your broader point that wherever possible you should, you should seek to make permanent changes. Thank you. Well, Turnbull. Um, <clears throat> turning to uh, the <coughs> R&D relief um, for um, tax relief for SMEs, um, there was a subcommittee of this committee which I was on which looked with a certain degree of alarm at the absolutely explosive growth in the cost of this this scheme and uh, you came up probably your predecessor or predecessor but one uh, for some mod, um, mitigation of that by requiring people to uh, register in advance <coughs> we didn't really as a committee think very much of that um, the next thing was that the the rates were actually made less generous and we were getting complaints from people that I haven't been gaming the system but I'm getting the rate cut just as much as the person who has been gaming the system. The next stage on is that you announced that those SMEs who are really in the business of scientific advance and concentrate on it, uh, got 40% of their expenditure or whatever, will be getting an extra allowance. So I think you're correcting maybe the, the, that fault that simply cutting the rates wasn't going to do the job. However, I think I would still think that there is still quite a lot of scope for people to put in thin applications, ones that are poorly justified or even completely bogus. And it's not helped by the fact that in order to get the money to the, the companies, you tend to pay when you get the, uh, the, the, the form in digitally and then ask questions afterwards. I, th I would hope you're going to but it, the HMSA is going to increase the degree of vigilance um, and uh, not just kind of give them the money maple and ask questions afterwards because I think you will need that degree of defence against the kind of uh, trivialisation of the scheme that was going on. Can I yes. give you my colleague yes. uh, <laughs> Dan York Smith for those details, Lord Turnbull? Um, Yes, I, I think that's exactly right, and that is um, that is something that HMRC has been looking at and been um, looking at further ways that it can ensure that all of the claims are legitimate. You're right, though, that um, the expenditure, particularly on the SME scheme, has really uh, increased very substantially, and that was what drove the decision in the autumn. And I think from a kind of value for money perspective, that was one of the other concerns that we estimated that we were only getting 0 .6, 0 0.6 to £1.28 pounds per pound of tax foregone from the SME scheme, as opposed to the large company scheme, the Research and Development Expenditure Credit, which was getting sort of £2.40 to £2.70 per pound of tax foregone. Um, and so the reforms in the autumn were also about boosting the more effective R&D expenditure credits. So we took three billion out of the SME scheme in order to put a billion and a half back into the large company scheme. And one of the things that we said in the budget we would do is we would consult on potentially merging the schemes, which would both be a simplification, but also the evidence is that the, the large company scheme is a more effective one in terms of value for money. But definitely HMRC are continuing to look at ways where they can balance 
the the long standing pressure certainly in in the early part of the last decade the pressure was on the pace at which HMRC could pay out to legitimate claimants versus the checks and balances in the system and and balancing that up where a lot of these companies are sort of pre-revenue and require and and use the R&D tax credit um, to provide cash flow in order for them to con continue to do the research. Just while we're on specific measures, can I just quickly pick um, pick you up on one other point that has been a matter of interest to the Finance Bill Subcommittee, which is off payroll working in IR35. And I see in Para 3.22 of the OVR report, it says that the latest estimate is that these measures yield an average of 1.5 billion a year over the forecast period, around double our previous estimate. Can you just explain to the committee what what is going on here within this sector? What, what why is it being double the estimate? Um, so, well, I, I, I can cover a bit of the, the reforms. Um, I may have to come back to you on precisely what our understanding of what's driving the increase is. But just, just to clarify, the reforms that were introduced were about changing, um, changing the burden of proof for whether or not someone was caught by the IR35 rules, which are whether you are actually in an employment relationship rather than a, a self-employment or contractor relationship. So it didn't change the underlying substance of whether or not you were judged to be a contractor or not. Um, but what it did was it put the, put the onus on the engager to determine whether you were, because the evidence was there was very, very widespread non-compliance, both because it's complicated for a, 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 an individual to determine uh, whether or not they're, they're self-employed or whether, they, um, whether they're substantively employed. Um, and so this, this hasn't changed the kind of underlying rules, it's just changed where the burden of proof is. We started that in the public sector um, and there, were, there was evidence that it was w working. We've made various changes to try and improve um, or reduce the burdens on the people applying the rules, but I think this demonstrates that the non-compliance with the rules was possibly even greater than it, it anticipated when the measure was introduced in, I think, 2020, we extended it to the private sector. It would be very good if you could just provide in writing any further details you can answer that specific question. Lord Layard, sorry. I I don't want to distract from others yes. asking. And if we could go back to your remark about skills uh, and that we do so well for the academic 50% and so badly for the other 50%. Um, isn't this basically due to different uh, funding regimes affecting these two groups? So, so if you take the academic group, um, they've had applied to them the Robbins principle that uh, if you are qualified to go on to the next step, you should expect to be able to find a place. And that's been ensured by essentially demand-led funding, which is also very good from the provider's point of view, because the provider knows that if they can put on a course and get students, it will be automatically funded. Whereas if you take the, the regime facing the other 50%, they're not at all in the position where they know that they can proceed and, and what the paths are because of the funding system. So the FE funding, set by the Treasury and micromanaged by the department. Uh, a college can't say, well, I really think this course is needed. I'm, I'm going to put it on and, and, and I will get funded for it. Th this is a tremendous damper on the whole operation of the FE system. And then if you look at apprenticeship, which is incredibly important, um, especially for young people, Young people apprenticeships have actually not been falling <laughs> uh, over, the, over the last last some years, um, and, and there's just a huge excess demand. I think that UCAS have reported on this. Um, there's just not enough apprenticeships for the people wanting them. So these young people they can't see their way way to what they want through FE <laughs> or through apprenticeship. Uh, and I wonder if, if it isn't time to, to try and review that whole section in the light of the Robbins principle. Why, why can't the Robbins principle, that if you qualify for the next level, you can expect to go on, be applied in, to that group of people? I was, I was wondering, I mean, it's a big issue, this, but is it something that could be covered in the next spending review? Well, I think it's a very um, interesting issue. Um, funding structures may be a reason why um, we haven't made as much progress as we would like. Um, but I think also regulatory structures 
have an impact to um, the fact that uh, universities have a high degree of autonomy and are able to invest in uh, being centres of excellence uh, without being micromanaged has made our higher education institutions rated second only to the United States globally, which is um, very important. And I would also say, historically, a lack of rigour in our skills qualifications or perceived lack of rigour compared to our higher education qualifications um, has also meant that they haven't been valued as highly. I think what I've learned as Chancellor is that actually over the last four or five years, I'll, I'll look out the exact numbers in terms of the take-up of apprenticeships. I must admit I'm s surprised to hear your, your view that... Youth mm, apprenticeships. Right. I'll, well, I'll, I'll write to you, if I may, with the exact yeah. numbers on that. Um, but actually, because I thought there was an issue here, I asked Sir Michael Barber to do a, a proper review of the progress we're making. And I think his view and my view, but I don't want to preempt what he finally says is that actually there has been enormous progress. The apprenticeship program is one of the great successes. I met a young apprentice on helping to construct HS2 just outside Birmingham and she told me with enormous pride how proud she was to be doing an apprenticeship because she would get a degree at the end of it without having tens of thousands of pounds of debt and she was able to work throughout it and it was incredibly rewarding and she was learning very valuable engineering skills. So I think it's been a great success. But the exam question I would like to answer is, at the end of this process, will our skills be as good as they are in Germany, Switzerland, or Singapore? Um, it, it's great that we're improving them, but are we improving them to uh, the very best internationally? Because that's what we need to do, and that's what Sir Michael is working on. Well, Griffiths? I wonder if I can follow that up. Um, I'm very, I feel very reluctant to criticise the Treasury or its officials because it's the only department in government which really speaks for the taxpayer and for really low inflation. But on this issue, something that... Uh, I mean, I really believe in apprenticeships like uh, Lord Layard. And um, I'm dismayed all the time I read in the press from business people who say... Um, We've given up actually on starting apprenticeships because government doesn't understand really what we're doing. And it seems to me in an apprenticeship, learning by doing is almost more important than the piece of paper you have at the end of a course. And I just wonder if Treasury officials, when they're allocating funding and so on to this area, focusing too much on the indicator of success being the, the uh, you know, certificates handed out rather than looking, particularly in small businesses, rather than looking at the day-to-day -day sort of advice which is given between people which can't easily be captured by some, as you would for higher education, where it's more appropriate, and whether this doesn't need to be changed to unlock it, because, I mean, I'm an optimist, but I think apprenticeships have a tremendous future. Um, but I hate criticizing treasury officials. Well, that's extremely welcome, uh, that last <laughs> bit. Um, but um, if I could just um, switch back to my response to Lord Layard. I mean, I think if you look at the sort of classic German apprenticeship, which, you know, is immensely respected, they managed to combine yes. uh, all that verbal communication, uh, which is so important in learning, with a, a qualification at the end of a process that is completely transferable and totally rigorous. And it is true that lots of employers resent paying the apprenticeship levy because we are very strict about how it's spent. And we say that it has to be a rigorous course which gives you transferable skills. And of course, understandably, lots of employers would like just to spend it on their in-house training which they were going to have to do anyway. But if we were to do that, we would not have made the progress we've made in 
setting up a rigorous program which is giving people transferable skills. So I think that's not to say it's perfect and I think we should listen to employers and there may well be aspects of the way the current scheme works that are too rigid um, and we can always benefit from listening more closely to employers but I wouldn't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Right. If I could and perhaps personally reassure as the official responsible for this area in the Treasury, um, as, as the Chancellor said, we're doing a huge amount of work both with the Department for Education and with Sir Michael Barber exactly because of the reasons you set out. We care deeply about making sure that the demand and supply equation is as balanced as it can be in the market and we certainly uh, want to make sure that we're valuing all aspects of skills training on the job as well as um, the outcomes that, that individual learners achieve. And that has to be a comprehensive um, approach. We're not just looking at apprentices, we're also looking at T levels. Uh, we're also working with the Department for Education on the lifelong um, entitlement and how we can bring that to life as well. So, and um, just to personally assure you, uh, this is not a simplistic um, approach. And we have a dedicated team in the Treasury who all they do is look at this question. Great. Thank you very much indeed. Very can I, sure. can, I, uh, can I bring in Baroness and move on to the Bank of England, mm. and, which is the subject of our. Uh, ongoing inquiries at the moment. Um, Baroness Little. Thank you, Chancellor. Um, this is a growth question. Due to the growing complexity and length of the annual monetary policy and financial policy remit letters, it used to be about, what, four or five paragraphs. Now it's about six or seven pages. Is there a risk that the Bank of England is being asked to do too much? I think it's a very good question to ask, but I think it's also important that I, as Chancellor, um, have a very simple expectation of the Bank of England's uh, responsibility when it comes to monetary policy, which is to return us to our 2% target for inflation. Um, and, you know, I recognise that what they're doing is immensely complicated and the regulation and stability of financial markets needs very, very careful oversight. But I hope if you ask the Governor, um, as part of your inquiry, he would say that he's never been any in any doubt uh, over the clarity of what it is that we are expecting from him, which indeed is laid down in the legislation. Well, what's the decision-making process within the Treasury about constructing these letters? Uh, and is there not a case for a bit more transparency? It, it's, uh, it would be very helpful for us to grasp what the priorities are, because everything is, is turning, net zero has turned up in, in it now, so uh, it, is, it looks as if it's becoming just a catch-all. In fact, three of, uh, three of our witnesses last week were describing it as flab. I think the, that, that's unfair, if I may say. Um, it wasn't me that said it. it no, no, I appreciate <laughs> that. It's very unfair of your witness, Ernest <laughs> Little, to say that, um, because um, we have a primary objective for the Monetary Policy Committee, which is inflation, and we are very clear that is a primary objective. Mm -hmm. The secondary objective is to support the government's economic policy, and that is that includes, for example, the things that I was setting out in the budget, the four E's, you know, reducing economic inactivity, strengthening our education system, and so on. And, of course, as we develop that economic policy, uh, it changes in response to a changing global situation, changing understanding of what we need to do to deal with our productivity issues, and that is reflected in the letters. But I, th I think it's important that they're always clear what their primary objective is, and I hope they always would be. If, if I could just say, though, in the construction. If I could just comment on, on that point and the, and the process, um, our teams between the Treasury and the Bank of England spend quite a lot of time working very closely on the content of the draft letters. So there's full transparency with the bank about how we're thinking about taking the economic priorities into the remit itself. And that, and that happens over quite a considerable period of time. Um, but as the Chancellor said, ultimately, our job is to set out the priorities in that letter and to make sure that the remit is, is full. Uh, and um, but the process itself is transparent and collaborative. I just want to just pick up on Baroness Little's point. Sorry, Baroness Little, do you have any? I, I, I hear what you're saying that it was a witness who was saying it was flat. But I just want to just pick you up, though, Chancellor, if I may. I mean, 
Um, when you read the, F, the letter you sent the FPC, I mean, it does, it does cover the water. It covers openness, competitiveness, competition, innovation, climate change and energy security, home ownership, ve venture and growth equity, da da da. Um, you know, it's, it's a lot of points. In it, in it, though, there is reference to what we were discussing earlier, um, which is um, non-bank financial institutions, and it's essential that appropriate risk and oversight and mitigation systems are in place for them. Do you, do you not feel, though, that therefore within this sort of thicket of perfectly understandable objectives and secondary objectives you're setting them, that it would be possible for the committee just to get a bit lost in terms of what is and isn't important? I, I, I understand why you asked the question, and it's absolutely right that you should scrutinise us on uh, the processes by which these letters are written. But um, there are inevitably a lot of considerations where we have to work with the Independent Bank of England and the independent regulators in order to make sure that all the different elements of government economic policy are understood and agreed to. But the way that we try, and I shall read your report with great interest, the way we try and square that circle is by being very clear what are primary objectives and what are secondary objectives. And you know, and I'm going to channel my inner Mervyn King, were he to be here, Lord King, which is um, he has often uh, picked up on the point, and I think he said that he questions about whether um, when you're looking at your elevating climate change risk as a systemic risk, perfectly arguable, but there is, for example, no mention of other risks that are equally systemic, like pandemic risk and other things. So, how how is it that these risks are chosen to be one is one is seen as systemic and the other one is not? And you know more than anyone about what the risks that pandemic risk. You know, yes, indeed. Be. And uh, uh, when we respond to your report, we will no doubt make important improvements to the way these letters are considered, drafted, and agreed to. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, we may return to that point, Lord Blackwell. Um, can I come on to the uh, question about pension funds and their equity investments, Charles? Uh, <coughs> as you know. Um, pension fund investment in real assets has shrunk dramatically over the last 20 years, um, particularly equity investments. And that's been a response to um, both the Sonsi 2 kind of regulations around you know, discounting liabilities and um, requiring pensions to be solvent as if they were going to go bankrupt. Or it's also been to the accounting rules um, and the way these have pension funds Blend up on corporate balance sheets. Uh, you mentioned in, in, this was an issue in your Edinburgh reforms. Uh, you know, do you think it is possible to get to a situation where pension funds can be contributing much more to enterprise and the real economy in their investments? Yes, I do, and I think it's essential they do. And um, it's a project where. Um, we will be saying more in the months ahead, but I set myself a deadline in the budget of the autumn statement as the time by when I want to conclude all of the work that we're going to do. But I'm not going to wait until November before uh, making progress on this issue. Um, but it's very important for a number of reasons. As you rightly say, there's five trillion pounds of pension fund assets. I think less than 1% are invested in unlisted um, businesses and that's a big opportunity missed at the same time we have a a large number of really promising companies in the technology and life science and green industries sectors who sometimes say that they can't easily access the capital they need we then have companies like arm that decide to list abroad again part of a not having the choice of capital that they might otherwise have had and then I think there's a question of value for money for pensioners uh, if their pension funds are not are avoiding some of the most high growth opportunities. Based against that, there's always risk, fiduciary responsibility, taking a responsible attitude, looking forward to uh, your responsibilities as a trustee of a pension fund, which we fully respect. Um, but I think it's a very important issue. and. I would say the other international factor in this is the Inflation Reduction Act in the United States, which is providing big subsidies. So we need to look at the availability of capital for our most promising industries and 
that's a very high priority. Thank you very much. Lord Davis, do you want to come in? Yeah, just, just to follow that up, Chancellor, the, the idea that pension funds should invest in the long-term growth of the economy sounds like a marriage made in heaven. In practice, it's proved very difficult to achieve. Your predecessors have talked about this often, so I'm pleased that you promised something in the months ahead. Um, are you seized with the fact that concurrently the Department of Work and Pensions is consulting on a set of regulations that will determine the funding approach of pension funds, which, to put it crudely, is adopting a completely contrary approach? There, there is this contradiction here, and I'm, I'm really just asking, are you aware of this, and is some uh, um, something going to be sorted out to balance these competing demands? I'm, I am aware of that, and I'm actually aware that there's a lot of consultations mm -hmm. going on in this area in different ways, and so I want to just bring them all together and come to a conclusion as to how we're going to address the issue raised by Lord Blackwell because um, I think we've been doing a lot of thinking about it in different places by different people. It's time we brought it all together and solved the problem. Thank you very much. I want to turn to Lord Turnbull briefly on another topic. <clears throat> the last report this committee produced was on the central bank digital currency and there was a debate in which Lord Bridges spoke very eloquently, uh, somewhat in sceptical in tone. So the question is, if this central bank digital currency had been in existence in the last two weeks, would that have made the management of this financial crisis easier or more difficult? Um, I think it's a difficult question to answer because it depends what the rules under which it operated would have been and what the constraints, the regulatory constraints would have been. Um, I fully accept that there are risks that have to be managed were we decide to go for a central bank digital currency. There's a consultation happening at the moment which is going to conclude on June the 7th um, where we will listen to the advice that you give and, and many other people give. Um, the only thing I would say is that I don't think that doing nothing, not having a digital currency is itself a risk-free option because in the end, cash and the ability to convert currency to cash is one of the foundational aspects of our financial system, which means that all forms of uh, money are equal because any can be converted to cash. As we move to a digital world, which is becoming increasingly cashless, I think it's a legitimate question to ask as to whether actually you need to have a central bank-backed digital currency to create the same stability in the system. But if you do that, it needs to be done with guardrails. And so at the moment, I think the, the plan is to limit uh, the amounts that people can hold to between 10 and 20,000 um, pounds and to have you know, sensible guardrails. But none of this has been decided. We haven't decided if we're going to have one. If we do have one, it won't uh, be put in place until the second half of this decade. And there'll be a lot of work to do to get there. Uh, and that's why we're having the consultation. Given the importance of some of the issues you've just touched on, will Parliament have a vote on whether to introduce it? Well, we haven't yet decided what it is that we want to do, so it's difficult to know. Obviously, if there's any legislative changes that are needed, then Parliament will have full opportunity to uh, comment and decide on that. But because we have decided what we're going to do, it's not possible to answer that question. Yeah, I mean, would it not be just, just in principle, just be easy just to say, of course, Parliament would vote yes or no to introduce one? It would be easy to say if we knew what it is we wanted to do, but it would be wrong to say that ahead of a consultation, which is still uh, hanging in the air. It's very useful. Um, I don't know if colleagues have got any further questions. No. Chancellor, thank you very, very much. We've covered an enormous uh, number of issues, from micro to macro, and you have handled our questions incredibly courteously, eloquently, and thank you very, very yeah, much yeah. indeed. And thank yeah, you very much yeah, to your yeah, officials you. as well for coming. Thank you both. And thank you all three. Thank, thank you very much. The proceeding has ended.
The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended.